Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome in from across the continent. My name is Jesse. I'm here with another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. And since we've got some new faces in the crowd and as a speaker today, I'll note that if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, you're catching us on an exciting day for a number of reasons. First of all, happy family day to all those that are off today and get the chance to watch this after the fact. I know we got a lot of classes off, out and about, enjoying the weather today, uh, but we hope you can take the chance to catch this exciting program after the fact as well. And a big welcome into our audience that is joining us from truly a little bit of everywhere. We've got BC, Alberta, all over Ontario. I'm in Newfoundland. It's a good time all around. Now, as I said, today is exciting for a number of reasons. Number one, this is February. So this is our entire month dedicated solely to the most amazing women in science, engineering, exploration, all on planet Earth. We have, I think, 55 broadcast this month. We just wrapped up our Epic If Then series last week, which you can check out on our YouTube channel. Lots to explore and discover with the coolest women on planet Earth. Today's also exciting because we are back with our friends at Environment and Climate Change Canada. We did the Changing Planet series back a few months back. It's on our YouTube channel too. Five amazing scientists. Lots to check out there. We're doing another Changing Planet series later in the season, but right in the middle of February, we wanted to bring you some really amazing stories of what Environment and Climate Change Canada scientists, engineers, explorers, are doing to understand the world around us, to make it better, to save species, to go adventuring. There are some great stories to come all week long, and you can check them out at our web page there. Now, we wanted to kick off with a little bit about water. I've been very lucky in my life. I've had the chance to travel to a lot of countries all over the world, and one of the things that really always strikes me is that you can't just have a clean drink of water. A lot of the water systems are polluted, rivers are polluted, lakes are polluted. How we deal with that is in a really different way than we do in Canada. And so today we're going to kick off with Elizabeth Jameson, who's going to tell us a little bit about the amazing stuff that Canada does to measure water levels, flows in our rivers and lakes across Canada. Uh, she's with the National Hydrological Service, uh, and she helps run the National Hydrometric Program called the Water Survey of Canada. So without further ado, I'm going to bring her in to explain a little bit about what that job looks like on a day-by-day -day basis. Thank you so much for joining us today, Elizabeth, and welcome to the program. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, Jesse. Thanks for having me. We are so uh, thrilled to kick off with another series with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Honestly, it is such a thrill every time. And uh, I know you've got a lot, of sh lot to share. I can speak English. But so I'll zip my lip and uh, leave it to you to take us away. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. So everyone can see my slides now. Uh, um, yep, you're perfect. And, uh, yeah, as Jesse mentioned, um, I'm a water resources engineer at Environment and Climate Change Canada, and I'm really excited to to be here today and to talk to you about about water and why I care so much about water and I'm so passionate about water. Um, and so, as Jesse said, we're the National Hydrological Service. We're responsible for collecting data and information on water quantity, how much water we have in our rivers and lakes across Canada. I thought first I'd introduce you to, to myself and tell you what's my story. Um, I've always liked the outdoors and being near water. Uh, I was fortunate to grow up in a family that had a sailboat and we learned to sail and we had many awesome sailing vacations as kids. I've got three sisters, so we were a packed boat, always outdoors. And I think that really taught me the love of water and being outdoors. And as I got older, I got into sailing camps and sailing school and, and, and began racing. And here's a picture of my twin sister and I, we were really into sailing. Um, and that really turned my head towards water and, and physics really, of all things. And I turned it into a job. So my summers were spent teaching and coaching other kids how to sail. And I think from an early age, I knew I liked science in the natural world. I wasn't that keen on, on biology. There was too much sort of memorization for me, but I liked topics that I could problem solve my way out of. So things that I could observe at, an, at a human scale and that were dynamic. Uh, and then I translated that into, uh, into kind of my career now. So I'm a hands-on engineer. And I found by studying rivers, I was able to combine those passions that I had for like understanding fluid dynamics, that is how fluids like air and water move. Um, and, and from what I learned through sailing and becoming a river engineer, um, sailing is a very dynamic environment where you're, you're learning to read the wind, to, to, to change your direction of the boat, the sail. And uh, a lot of similar things apply to that in, in rivers. And what excites me most about this field in water is that water is critical for us, for humans to live well and long on earth. Um, I also thought since uh, it's family day, and I'm not just an engineer, I'm a mom too. Um, so as it's family day across many parts of Canada, I'd recognize my family. And since they, I've got three boys and since they were born, I've tried to instill in my kids the value and importance of nature and water in particular. 
Uh, here are a few examples of us enjoying water. Uh, the top picture is my son Thomas skating on the Rideau Canal in Ottawa. That's where we live in Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, my son Henry fishing at 31 Mile Lake in Quebec, one of our favorite canoe camping spots. And my son, youngest son George checking out the status of the Rideau River level um, in the spring, perhaps a budding river hydrologist. So why is water important? And I thought I'd maybe give you all a few, maybe 10 seconds to think in your heads about five ways we, we use or need water. What makes water so important? Ooh, and if anyone wants to chime in in the chats, by the way, they're certainly able to do so. For me, I'm literally drinking a glass of water that is super pure and nice and wonderful that I just got out of my tap, which I'm eternally grateful for. Uh, we just went a couple hours ago to sort of hang out on the bay. We're right on the ocean here in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. So that was really, really nice to get to sort of recreate on the water and enjoy it and take it in. So those are some options. Uh, yeah, geez. that's I, good. I love okay, Jesse. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, do you want to read some answers? Yeah, we've got uh, in, enjoying skating, enjoying water, enjoying swimming. So those are some options coming in online. So again, sort of in going out and recreation on the water, drinking water. And you've got a whole bunch of images here that I think you're going to cover with some more. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe some of these pictures will prompt people to think of other ways maybe they didn't first think of. So as Jesse mentioned, water, water supply, fresh drinking water, that's critical. As Jesse also mentioned, recreation. So in order for us to have water and safe access to water, for swimming or paddling, all sorts of fun things that we do in Canada and the United States. Uh, hydropower, so we, we generate a lot of electricity and power that we need in our homes to keep us warm in winter uh, or cool in the summer when we use air conditioning. Uh, transportation, a lot of goods are shipped by water on ships, ensuring we have adequate water depth for a lot of those ships to pass in certain rivers is important. Uh, and fishing, so, so our fish and, and the fisheries uh, need a good amount of water. And I think plants, right? We didn't talk about agriculture. So so plants and trees, all of that, um, parts of the earth need water too. So it's, it's critical for so many things and ultimately for us to live well uh, and long on earth. Um, does anyone know how much water we have? So we, we assume Canada and the United States have a lot of fresh water and compared to many countries we do. Um, across, across the world on earth, we, we only have about 2% of water in our rivers and lakes. So to use an analogy, that's like one little teaspoon of water in a big bucket full of water. That's all our fresh water in rivers and lakes across the earth. The, the rest of our water is in the oceans. And then we have some about 2% frozen in our polar ice caps. And then we have a very, very small amount in our atmosphere as vapor. Um, and I like to think about it and, and get other people thinking about fresh water. Um, and also, so in trying to understand how much we have, ask the question, do we have too much or do we have too little? So uh, we know that, uh, especially with climate change, the frequency of rain events um, and rain generated floods is increasing. And here's an example, a picture from my local area. A couple of years ago, we had a pretty devastating flood. Uh, you can see the car underwater in a soccer field. It probably took a long time for that water to recede and many homes and people's lives were impacted. So there are times when we have too much water. Um, there are also times when we have too little water, when we have a drought. Here's a picture of the Fraser River in British Columbia um where you could see by the bridge and the width of the river normally that that river is full of water and with a drought the water level dropped considerably and they, you know where are the fish going to live when the water looks like that the river looks like that we also know that the amount of land um that's going to suffer extreme drought is projected to increase from some of the climate um, studies and research so something we need to think about and ultimately we need to measure it we need to know how much we have so we can manage it properly. If this is a critical resource, we need to manage it. We need to know how much we have. So this is going to get into the sort of meat of the things that I care most about in terms of measuring water. So I'm going to show you a few different pictures, examples of rivers. And as you look at these, I want you to think about how would you measure the water in these different locations in these different conditions? Here's a picture of a river in Quebec. Uh, you can see like lots of boulders, sort of like little mini mountain stream, sections of shallow and deep fast flowing water. Uh, or you could have a big, deep flowing river. This is up in BC, big mountains. You have a big, wide and deep river. What do you do when your river is covered in ice, covered in snow and ice? How do you measure that? 
And then what do you do when that ice breaks, starts to melt? You have giant chunks of ice that are floating down the river. How do you measure that? You don't have to give me answers right now, but I want you to think about it. So we've been trying to measure water for a long time and the methods and technologies that we use have changed a lot. So here's a really cool picture uh, from over a hundred years ago, the Winnipeg River. And although technology has changed a lot, we still rely on some of the basic principles and some of the basic technology. Um, so here a hundred years ago, it took five men, a canoe, some basic technology. And what they did is they strung a line across the river and then using these long poles, they would sound the bottom. So sounding. So they'd try to touch the bottom and see how deep the river was. And they'd move themselves along in the boat, along the cross section, along that line, and get lots of different depth measurements to map the bottom of the river. Because we know the bottom of the river is not uniform and it's going to vary. So you're going to want lots of measurement points along the river. Here's another old picture of someone trying to measure the velocity or speed of the river. Uh, from a very basic cable way, what we call a cable way. So another cable is strung across the river. Can you tell from looking at this picture which way is the water flowing? Think inside your heads. Does this look safe? <laughs> Imagine sitting on this chair. You can hardly see the chair. Uh, right over that really fast, dynamic flowing water. And you're holding on to a piece of string. And there's something on the end of that string. What's on the other end of that string? So if you guessed it, the water is moving from left to right. You can tell by that string, right, which way the water is pulling it. And at the other end of that string could probably be what we call a sounding weight. It's sort of like that big torpedo looking thing. So here's a more modern picture of a cable way with, with two technologists sitting in the cable way and their line, the bottom of their line, they've got that, um, that lead weight. It's like a torpedo. And that weight helps hold the string more vertical in the river. And then above that weight is what we call a current meter. And I actually have one here to show you. And so this is the same technology that we still use today. Not as much. We use other more modern technology, but in some cases it's still the most reliable technology. It's called mechanical current meter. And it's, it's just above, I think I have another picture here. Yeah. So it spins kind of like a windmill through the water. The faster the water is flowing, the faster this current meter spins and we count the revolutions over time, and we can get an estimate of velocity doing that. We still use that technology today. So we've adapted, we've learned more, and we're always adapting. We're always trying to rethink how we can improve the conditions and the, and the measurements and the data. And one of the exciting things about sharing this with you is that I know new generations like yourself are gonna have even better ideas on how we can innovate to measure water. Here's a more modern cable way out in British Columbia. You can see it looks a lot safer, a lot sturdier. It is a bigger river. Instead of suspending that weight and that mechanical current meter, now there is what we call a tethered boat, a float. And I actually have one of those with me to show today. This is, a, this is sort of like a mini version. I can't see myself, so hopefully I'm holding it in the field of view, Jesse. Um, but this is called a trimaran. It's got three pontoons, three for try. It's just made of plastic. And inside, you can see there's a little hole here. And here we place the sensor. And this floats on the top of the water. It gets towed by a boat, or in this case, held from the cable way. And then that sensor in this boat takes the measurements, while the operator stands safely high above, away from the water. Another example, what else have we adopted? Remote control boats. Now, most kids love this because who doesn't like remote cars, remote boats? Uh, now what we can do with remote control boats is we can measure the water depth and the velocity with a single person standing on shore using a remote control. This is much safer. Now they don't need to be over or in the water to measure the water, and it usually takes less time. So in this example, you can see the person on shore holding the remote control, and you can see the boat, and the boat can maintain speed and it can travel back and forth over the river with the sensor underneath. Here's a picture of my colleague Galin showing the underside of the boat. So you can see the sensor now in the center of the boat uh, of the hull. And so that sensor is sending out signals and taking the measurements. And, and with smaller equipment and the need for fewer people, now we can take those things and we can put them in helicopters and we can go to more remote locations. So like this, we can we can now get to more places to measure. 
we don't need five people. We don't need the same heavy duty equipment, um, which is great. This is probably my most technical slide that I have, but because it's such an important part of what we do, and I thought the audience would probably be capable of understanding it. I'd, I'd sort of walk you through it and, and talk to you about these sensors. So generally these sensors are acoustic sensors. And if you know what the word acoustic means, it means sound. And in particular, the type of sensors we use are called acoustic Doppler current profilers. And what they do is they are a single sensor placed just in the, the, the depth of flow. It sends out acoustic signals. So it's sending out sound waves and those sound waves are bouncing off the bottom of the river or they're bouncing off little particles that are pa passing through the water and then they're receiving the bounce signal and they're measuring how long does it take to bounce off that object and come back and from that measurement it can measure how far away the bed is how deep the water is or how fast is the water flowing through that um that beam of of acoustic um sound energy and so as a boat or remote control boat, like the examples I've just shown you, you could be on a motorboat with a sensor deployed on the side, or you could be in a remote control boat or a tethered boat. As the boat travels along the river, it's measuring the bottom of the river and the depth. It's also collecting data on all the velocity all across the river. And in this graph, I'm showing colors of what could look like the results. So blue and purple, that's kind of like the slow velocities. Orange and red, that's your high velocity. So you can map out the pattern of velocity in the river now. And we know it's not the same everywhere. And we can't see, usually that we can't see the bottom of the river. We can't guess what the conditions are like. Now we can, we can map that out with these acoustic sensors, which is really exciting. And in this example, you can see, okay, so it's slower near the edges, it's slower near the bottom, and the fastest point of the, of the river is in the center in this case. Now I'm gonna come back to those ice measurements. So a hundred years ago, it would take five people. Here's an, another example from the Winnipeg River. And what they would have done is cut a big channel to open up the ice, to get access to underneath the ice, to the water, to measure it. And they would have set up this sort of sled contraption, probably on the other end of that line, is that current meter that I showed you earlier. And what they'd have to do is they'd have to measure and each location, each depth that they wanted a measurement, it would take a very, very long time. Each position, different depths at each position, it would take a long time. We don't do that anymore. So here's that one of that first pictures I said, well, how are we gonna measure under the ice and snow? These aren't animal tracks. These are crews that went out and at periodic intervals, they drilled holes with a really nice cool ice auger. So drilled a hole, go about 10 meters, drill another hole drill maybe 20 or 30 holes across the river. And now with just two people, they drill their holes and they use those same acoustic sensors, this time attached to a pole, and they put that through the ice. And now they can measure the depth and the velocity um, through that hole. And then they, they work their way along the river. Um, and this is how we're, you know, even in the winter time, even when we have complete ice cover over our rivers, we want to make sure we know how much water is in there. We're taking under ice measurements just like this. And there's how the, the beam um, shows, uh, you know, it's a invisible acoustic signal that's recording the depth and the water velocity. We're always looking for new ways to measure, to measure better, more accurately, to be safer, to be faster. And one of the fastest evolving technologies is the use of cameras. I find this the most exciting. Um, and, and with the use of cameras, we might not even need to put anything into the river to measure it, which makes it safer for the equipment, it makes it safer for us, gives opens up a lot of opportunities. How are we using cameras? We're using fixed cameras. So sort of like your traditional security camera that you might see now, it's pretty ubiquitous. We see security cameras everywhere we go, but we're putting these near our stations pointing them at the river and filming the water surface of the river. Or we might have game cameras or time-lapse cameras. They don't cost as much, they're easier to deploy, but they're not capable of transmitting images. So it might the, the technologist or the person in the field crew might have to come and download the images. Um, or anytime someone visits a site or you find yourself looking at a river, you can use your handheld camera, your mobile phone, take a video, take a picture. And, and most exciting is we're using drones. So now we can get well above the river, get the full width of the river in view and, and record videos. So what we're doing is we're rec recording rip videos of the river surface 
and using very um, special techniques to process these videos and measuring the water surface. So here's an example of some velocity vectors, for example, so vectors like a magnitude and direction of how fast the water is flowing um, at the water surface. So now we haven't even put any sensors in the river and we're able to measure the water velocity. It's really exciting. So Canada is a big country and we have a lot of rivers and lakes and we can't be everywhere measuring all the time. So we've established a network of stations. So there's places all across Canada where we have equipment set up permanently and we collect and transmit data there. This is what our network looks like. So we have over 2000 stations set up across Canada to measure water level and flow in mostly real time. So to give you an idea of these colors, green, if the, if the station color is green, it means we have water level or flow data from the last six hours. Uh, if it's yellow, it's a seasonal station. So there are some places where it's not important to have, for example, winter data or winter measurements. So it's sort of in hibernation, the yellow stations. And then red, uh-oh, something's wrong at that station. It's not transmitting data. We don't have data from the last six hours. So there might be a problem at that station. Um, so we have over 2,000 of these stations. Here's an example of, of one. In fact, this is a test site. So we have two stations side by side. We call this a look-in shelter. So it's like a little box beside, beside the river. There's a solar panel to collect uh, solar radiation to power the station, all the, the sensors. Are, uh, and there's like a data logger, all sorts of different cool, complicated equipment. And there's a transmitter. So as the data gets recorded, it gets sent up to a satellite. Satellite transmits that down to a receive station on land. Then from that receiver, we can, through the internet, we have, you know, um, at our fingertips on our laptops, we can get the data. Um, so just like you can go and check the weather every day, you can go and check the water, the water level and flow at all of these locations across Canada um, at what we call the water office. And I gave you the website there if you're curious. Uh, and, and the United States has an equally impressive hydrometric network. I know we have an audience from uh, across North America here, so I want to make sure I touch on this as well. They have over 13,000 stations, I think. And between Canada and the US, we work really closely with our colleagues at the United States Geological Survey, USGS. Um, because so much of what we do is so similar. We have the same challenges, with the same challenges with ice, with floods, with droughts. And it doesn't really matter where you're from. If you have a river and you're trying to measure it, you're probably trying to adapt and use some of the same methods. Um, and, and in fact, if we want to develop some standard methods, it's best if we do collaborate and we share knowledge and, and, and learning with each other. So coming to the end of my presentation, I thought I'd just sort of review why is water important? Um, and, and you guys gave some examples. We had a good chat about that. Um, it's really important for us to live and live well and long on earth. And, and really in order for us to, uh, we need to study it and measure it in a, in, to ensure that we ma manage it properly. So here's my call to action to all of you. Uh, what can you do? You could get involved, you could get outside, observe, experience, conserve, as Jesse said, one of the main sort of tenants behind a lot of these um, presentations. You know, water is an important resource, so don't use it if you don't need it. Most importantly, also be safe. Water can be dangerous in the summer, in the winter, at different times. So always make sure you're with an adult, you understand the risks of wherever you are, be safe. And finally, I've got some additional resources here, uh, perhaps for the teachers, if they want to look into some of these um, a bit more. The first two points here are the water office is where we have our um, hydrometric data and lots of other information. Um, the USGS water dashboard is really impressive. Um, I had a screenshot uh, in my presentation from that and you can go exploring there. I've got another link here about, you know, the importance of water and climate issues. Uh, and, and also kids, you can contribute. You can be a citizen scientist. There are so many opportunities to be a citizen scientist. I couldn't list them all here, but I put two examples that I thought are really interesting and, uh, and would be appropriate for this kind of age group. In Ottawa, we have the Ottawa River Keeper and they have what's called a River Watch Program. The River Keeper Alliance, I think, spreads across North America. So there's likely River Watch pro programs all across North America. And another really cool one that I think is amazing is called Coco Raz, um, which is a community collaborative rain, hail and snow network that you can 
get your own simple precipitation sensor. You can collect water in your backyard or snow or report on the conditions. You can upload that and that becomes part of a national weather service database. And the forecasters use that information. Um, and and I, I didn't really talk about the hydrological cycle, but it's really important to know where all the water is. So if we're, we're trying to predict what the stream flow is gonna be, predict what the water levels are gonna be, we kind of need to know how much rain has fallen or how much snow do we have on the ground. Uh, so that kind of, of data and information is really important. And yeah, this is uh, sort of the last slide I wanted to show. This is my colleague, Liz Lewis, again, with the spirit of women in science and engineering. Um, this is one of my favorite photos. Yes. Um, yes. She's a hydrometric technologist. She was making a visit to Ellesmere Island, probably one of the most remote locations we have. You can see her snowmobile in the distance. Um, this is, uh, yeah, she, this is how she accessed the site. She probably had to first take a helicopter and then a snowmobile. I, I, I don't know the details, but um, it's, a, it's a great picture. Um, it is a so, great yeah. picture. <laughs> oh, Elizabeth, sorry, we're a little delayed. I was just saying it's a great picture and that's the perfect end of the presentation. That was magnificent. Okay. And if you want to come out a screen share, I think it gives you a little more bandwidth and we can have our conversation and dive with Q&A. But that was magnificent. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us today. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. All right. We're back. We're together. Well, thank you again, uh, our YouTube audience. If you guys want to chime in with uh, questions, we'd love to have them. We've been getting some great emailed questions over the last few minutes. So I'll kick off with one. You showcased uh, you going out on these frozen rivers. And so I want to stress it's winter season. A lot of people are going out on rivers and on foot, on snowmobiles, whatever. Uh, how do you keep safe on a frozen river? Are there any tips and tricks as a scientist or just generally you want to yeah. share with our kids? Absolutely. I feel so strongly about that. And do you know what? It's becoming even more important with climate change to understand the risks because it used to be that in many locations across North America, it was reliable. We would know it gets cold in November, then in December, we'd get some really thick ice established. It'd be cold all winter. But now we're seeing so many more fluctuations in temperature and warmer conditions. Suddenly we have a thaw period in January, which we never had. And, uh, and so people need to be very careful and never assume, basically never assume the ice is safe. Always assume the ice is unsafe and then take incremental steps to test the ice. And so all our field technologists, myself included, even though I don't go out in the field very often, <laughs> we've done very specialized ice surface safety training. So we learn how to test the ice, what equipment to wear to make sure we're safe yeah. so that if something were to happen, how to protect ourselves. But I think just in general for the general public and for kids, basically never assume that the ice is safe. Um, and there are ways you can measure the thickness of the ice. And generally, I think 10 centimeters for an individual. And then the more weight, um, so like a truck, then you need like 25 centimeters maybe. Yeah. So um, keeping, keeping, and then the color of the ice, like it's a whole science. Um, but just assuming that it's not safe all the time is probably the best way to go. Honestly, I went to a pond the other day. Uh, we're in Western Newfoundland. And I mean, there's a snowmobile track that is firm. And we saw snowmobiles going across the middle of the pond. And I mean, there's clearly like a rutted track that had been there for quite some time. It's like, okay, so it got a sense that it's pretty thick. It's thick enough to support that machine. Good benchmark for safety. I'm still not keen to go out in the middle of the pond. Um, but as you mentioned, there are places where big trucks go on ice. I've been in Great Slave Lake where there's like whole ice roads that connect communities together. So ice can get to a point where it's safe, but that's a really important message for kids. Because every year we do have people in a lot of challenging situations yeah. that we say for going out on the ice and rivers and lakes. So it's really important to know the situation you're getting into. Thank you for mm -hmm. kicking off with that. Um, on the climate change note, we actually got a climate change question. That's a perfect segue to this. You know, for our kids, I always like to say, if you talk to your teachers, if you talk to your parents over the last 20 years, weather has changed a lot. Um, I grew up in Toronto and Toronto winters are radically different than they were when I was a boy. So I'm curious as a scientist, I mean, you have the data to collect too and, and an understanding of it, but how has the research that you've done or the work that you've done changed with climate change over the last however long? Yeah, well, so we don't, we're, we're, our main mandate is to provide the data. So yep. we try to collect the best data we can for other people to analyze the data and consider like what the changes are. But what we can say is in many cases, it's getting harder to measure because we're seeing more extreme conditions. So we're seeing more uh, what we would call like um, a rain event that peaks the river much faster. 
suddenly we have a rain event that peaks a river in January. We're not used to having to go out and measure a high flow event in January. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's also why we've had to adapt our technologies so that we can be uh, out at site um, collecting data under conditions that traditionally we didn't have to, to anticipate before. Um, so that's certainly one way in which we've had to adapt. Um, and studies have shown that it is likely that we'll have more frequent and higher precipitation rain sort of flood events. And we've yeah. kind of already started to see that. Yeah. And then we might have other periods of more extreme droughts. So now it's dealing with, uh, you know, right now across North America, we actually have had very little snow. So a lot of water resources engineers are getting nervous because we need that snow in the spring to melt and refill a lot of our lakes and rivers. So we need that water for drinking and other purposes. We've actually featured that as a story in Pakistan as well, where a lot of the communities rely on glacier flooding to sort of give them the water. And there's been some really ingenious solutions to helping make sure that people have a water supply because this thing that's been a, you know, a given for hundreds if not thousands of years is changing in a really radical way. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you showcased some of the drought and flood pictures at the beginning of the presentation. I grew up in Southern Ontario and like, there were no floods for my first 20 years. And then there's been like four in the last 10. And that is an astonishing shift for people to sort of mm -hmm. have to deal with. So thank you for that. All right. And eat, well, it's not necessarily an easy one, but it's one we get in almost every program we have. Is there a favorite part of your job? Something that really gets you up in the morning that you really love to do particularly? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's um, solving problems, especially yeah. in the data. So I love, I love, Visual, I like collecting data, visualizing data, creating maps. You can see I have this beautiful map here. I love maps. And you never know what you're going to learn from the data if you presented it in a different way. So visualizing data is, means to see it. You can plot it in a graph. You can plot it on a contour plot, which is like a plot of colors. There's so many different ways you can take the same piece of data and represent it in many different forms. And depending on that form, you might see or learn something different about that data. Uh, so that's probably the thing I like the most about um, my job every day is if I get to touch the data, observe the data and try to understand the data and, and look at it in different ways with different graphs and plots. Yeah, it's quite fascinating, regardless of discipline, sort of solving problems and being curious and getting to address new challenges is pretty much a universal among scientists and engineers. So I'm really glad you highlighted that. And I'm also glad you highlighted that map because if people are paying attention to it, those are not our provinces in Canada. So could you explain a little bit about what that map is all about? And yeah, our, yeah our sure. This is, this is a map of stream flow. So these are actually called watersheds. So each of these colors is a different watershed and flowing into one of our major rivers. I don't know how far you can see these red lines. Like here's yeah, the Mackenzie yeah. River. And uh each color, so this orange means all of the water. If a drop of water were to fall on this orange, it's going into Hudson Bay. Yep. So on, on many graphs, we like, or plots, uh, we like to show what are called watersheds, which sh sh show us where if water falls on land, ultimately which river and then which next river or which ocean is it gonna go into. So I wanna stress for our kids, because I just, I've always loved maps like this, so there's like points, of course, where the colors meet. So like, it could be like a hill or a mountain. And if it goes on one side of that, it goes all the way to Hudson Bay, like a thousand miles to the east. And if it goes on the other side exactly. of that, it goes to the Arctic Ocean. And that is a wild fact. It's very, I mean, it makes perfect sense, but it's also really weird. Um, so yeah. thank you for highlighting that. And the drop of water doesn't, doesn't carry a passport. So yeah. it's going into any country it wants to. We, we see that, I guess we've talked about the Amazon basin a lot and you'll see water cross numerous countries and go like thousands of miles. Like it'll be, it'll land in Ecuador uh, on the far west end of South America and it'll go all the way east to the Atlantic Ocean, which is incredible just based on how the landforms go. So uh, I'm glad we got a watershed conversation here. Um, we got a superlative question. We always get these. Is there a fastest river, a biggest river, anything? I mean, you're talking about hanging over these rivers with cool little devices. Uh, any highlights? <laughs> Uh, or like, well, for, I mean, one of my highlights was measuring the flow on the Ottawa River, and yeah. uh, it's two kilometers wide, two kilometers wide. So how much is that in miles multiplied by 1.6? One point, yeah, it's like 1.2 miles, 1.3 miles. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite, uh, quite large. Oh, yeah, divide. And uh, to do one measurement would take 45 minutes. And I remember talking to colleagues in France. How, how do you guys deal with these really large rivers? It takes you a long time. And they're like, oh, we don't have rivers that large. <laughs> That's not our problem. So 
as much as we do like to collaborate internationally and we work a lot with different countries to learn from their processes there you know canada has some very large rivers it's quite amazing and so some of our technologies and methodologies have had to adapt to that especially um i mean and that's just the ottawa river that's not nearly like that's not even the top 10 biggest rivers in canada um so I'm, yeah i'm so glad you highlighted this because like i grew up and the things near me were pretty small rivers like i had the mill creek i had the hummer river i had the dawn river and they're they're fantastic they're beautiful but like Canadians and Americans, for that matter, have these gigantic bodies of water. I hope all our people watching today get the chance to go to a really massive river in your life. It doesn't need to be the Amazon or the Nile. It can be something like the St. Lawrence, which is a magnificent, incredible body of water that is so integral to Canada and the U.S., for that matter. Um, they're magnificent. I mean, we, we hear about the Thames, the Seine, some of these European rivers, and they're like puddles compared to our big rivers. Like, we are, we're a big place. Canada and the U.S. are big countries. A lot of good stuff going on. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um... So uh, is there anything dangerous about this work? So we highlighted this great picture of your colleague at the end. Yeah. Elsmere Island is a very remote place to go to. Are there challenges when you're in the field, uh, when you get the chance to go, that are kind of scary? Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think the, the the probably the scariest picture was that one I showed of that gentleman sitting on that little chair. What really <laughs> probably didn't convey is the power of flowing water. And this is also in terms of that first conversation we had about ice, you know, yeah. ice on a lake that is safer than ice on a river underneath that ice on a river is flowing water and the ice on top of that is going to be a lot less stable, a lot less thick than ice on top of a, a lake. Um, but the power of water and so anytime that you are near that fast flowing water, it can pull you in. And again, our technologists, myself, having done field work, we're very specially trained in swift water safety so that we know how to move our bodies how to interact with swift fast flowing water um and even a small river if it's if the flow is fast enough there's enough force so we talk about forces water carries a lot of weight and force um that it could pull you under and yep. even with a life jacket you could get trapped under a rock or something so uh we take field safety very very um carefully and so generally if you're working in in water you usually are working in pairs so there's two of you uh we're always measuring the ice thickness to make sure there's a safe platform to work on uh but i think it's those open water conditions where the water is very turbulent very rough being out on a boat things are happening and moving very quickly and as soon as you start putting things in the water and if anyone's done that a kid you know puts a, a piece of string or something, it, it, you know, you feel the force, right? Like imagine a body part and then suddenly you're pulled in uh, and then it's very hard to recover from that. Again, it's why we're looking at remote control boats or safe cable ways to get people out of that fast flowing, um, very forceful water. Yeah. It's something that we cover in a lot of different kinds of broadcasts here, whether it's space exploration, Arctic, water. There's a lot of preparation and training that goes into this. So, I mean, mm -hmm. most scientists in general of all kinds do not take this work lightly. Uh, it's really important to know the facts, know the situation, make sure you're not in a situation where you're likely to face any sort of harms or dangers, uh, even in situations that might feel a little sketchy. So I'm really glad we got the chance to highlight that, Elizabeth. Um, and with that, frankly, time flies and you're having fun. So we're nearing the end of the broadcast. I want to okay. just ask if there's any final thing you want to highlight for our kids. Now, you had a beautiful last slide with all sorts of great resources. This is going to be on YouTube, so anyone can catch and check those, and we'll, we'll message them to our classes as well. Uh, but is there anything that you want to leave us with about your work, about the series with Environment Canada, anything to wrap us up? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think you, you you talked about getting out to see a big river. I would also say just getting to see your local creek, some yeah. area where you can build your own dam or build your own little structure and watch the pattern of flow around the rock. Watch what you can achieve by backing up and creating um, a dam, watching the water flow. I think there's a lot you can learn and that's a safe environment, right? Where it's just, you know, ankle deep and you're moving small rocks around. Uh, and you can create your own little artificial network of, of rivers just in that little environment right there. And the funny thing is, is that there are experts around the world studying rivers, studying the, the very complex, turbulent nature of flow around rocks. And they try to recreate these in a lab so they can have very sophisticated technology in the lab. Just very hard to measure water and recreate those conditions in the lab in a controlled environment. But we have a lot of these like right at our doorstep. 
Um, so I would, I would just encourage, yeah, kids to get out in those safe environments and explore. Totally. Usually I have a pretty good sense of where people are going to go with their final answer. That's totally different than I expected. And it's fantastic. And it's also so beautiful. I live on a, a river that has lots of sort of intermittent freezing. And so these ice things will grow off the rocks basically. And it changes yeah. the course of the river where it makes all these little mini waterfalls and terraces. And it's so beautiful just to witness. Um, I'm not creating them, but it's just, it's one of the great joys of my life is walking by that every single day. So enjoy the water in your life. That's a very cool suggestion for our kids. And if you do make your own dam, let us know, try not to dam the whole St. Lawrence kids. Okay. We're watching, but otherwise, uh, get out there and, and have some fun. Elizabeth, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us today. As I noted at the beginning, this is part of our Our Changing Planet series number two in conjunction with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Landon Dalgo is going to be joining us tomorrow. We've got four other broadcasts throughout the week every single day at 12 Eastern. So thank you for kicking us off on an epic journey and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so, so much. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Bye for now.